few months ago, I was going through some boxes in my attic when I came across this dress. And I actually made this when I was a 20-year-old student at university to wear to my end-of-year ball. I'm not a fashion designer, and I'm only an amateur dressmaker. And you can see that I based it on this pattern, which is by an American designer called Badgley Mishka, and it's published by Vogue. But this is not a talk all about me and my amateur dressmaking abilities. I want to talk about how fashion has become more democratic over the last 400 years or so. And I'm going to do that by comparing my dress here to some paintings all in the Royal Collection. By more democratic, I'm taking that to mean fashion has become available to a broader section of society, and it's more open to individual choice. So the first point to be made is that the majority of fabrics were simply unavailable to the majority of the population in the 16th and 17th century. It was the materials that drove the cost of clothing, not the labor involved in, for example, the tailor making them up. And even the very rich, so Henry VIII, for example, recycled his clothing and tailored them and changed them as fashion, fashions changed. It's not an exaggeration to say that in Shakespeare's time, a high-quality man's cloak could cost more than a house. And clothes were far more expensive than paintings. So if you look at this painting here of Charles I, we've already heard about him, with his family, Charles in this painting is wearing a suit that probably cost around 150 pounds. We know that from his wardrobe inventories. But the painting only cost 100 pounds, and it's by Van Dyck. Van Dyck's just arrived from Antwerp. He's one of the most famous artists working at this time. And the clothes that you see cost more than the painting. The painting is huge as well. It's a major commission, and it only cost 100 pounds. Charles spent approximately 5,000 pounds a year on clothes, and that wasn't even seen as particularly extravagant. He was criticized for many things, but his clothing extravagance wasn't one of them. So if we turn to my dress, my dress, the fabric for this, cost 10 pounds. I found it in a remnant basket in a fabric shop in Lewisham. Fabrics are so much cheaper nowadays because we can get synthetic fibers that can imitate the more expensive fibers, such as silk, which is what this is. And also, the processes of mechanization mean that weaving and dyeing are much quicker and don't have to be done by hand. Moreover, today you can be fashionable without wearing expensive materials. So in the 16th and 17th century, to be fashionable, you really had to wear the most expensive silks, and they usually came from Italy. Nowadays, though, you don't have to be particularly expensive in your fabric choice in order to be fashionable. So, for example, the, fa the trend towards vintage clothing positively emphasizes being thrifty, and people are proud of buying th something for a cheap price. And even high-end designers often use cheap fabrics like cheap undyed cotton, like this T-shirt that I'm wearing here today, um, as a fashion item, as a, back a backdrop for their logo or for a charitable message, like this T-shirt for breast cancer, or as a political slogan. White T-shirts also remain, have remained a fashion basic, so Vogue every year seems to proclaim the importance of a white T-shirt or a white vest as a, as a fashion basic. So imagine you were an ex, uh, an, a merchant in Elizabethan times, and you'd made your money, you were an up-and-coming um, member of the middle-class middle society, and you'd made your money importing something new like pepper. Um, even if you wanted to display how wealthy you were through your clothing, and that's, um, let's face it, one of the best ways of doing it, you might not have been allowed to wear exactly what you wanted to wear. And that's due to the presence of what are called sumptuary laws. These specified exactly what fabric, what colors, and what types of garments you could wear at every level in society. So, for example, an earl would be allowed to wear different things to a duke. These weren't a new thing. They'd been around since um, ancient Rome. So the emperor was the only person allowed to wear a toga dyed with Tyrian purple, a very expensive dye extracted from sea snails. But in the 16th century, century they really reached their apogee. Henry VIII and Elizabeth I loved sumptuary laws, and they kept um, releasing new sumptuary laws throughout the century. And I think that's due to the fact that the 16th century really sees the rise of this new merchant class, who are able to imitate the, their superiors or the nobility because they have the money to do so. I'm going to talk about sumptuary laws through this painting, which is um, a portrait of Elizabeth as a princess. So she's probably only about 14 years old here. And I'm going to talk about some of the fabrics that she's wearing and exactly where, that, where they fit into the sumptuary laws. So she's wearing a gown, which has been, is probably of silk, and it's been dyed with red. And the red here is probably um, comes from cochineal, which um, is created by crushing insects, and it was imported from South America during the 16th century. The Spaniards really controlled its distribution in Europe, and they really held a monopoly. It was such an expensive dye, it became a, a real target for piracy. 
She's also, if you look closely, you can see on this detail that I've blown up here, um, the fabric seems to have been woven with metal thread. So imagine a piece of fabric. It has threads running up and down, and then threads running from side to side, which are known as the weft threads. And this one, as well as having the red silk, it has metal threads here, which are probably of real gold. So imagine a gold coin that's been flattened, hammered many times to make it really, really thin. And it's then been um, cut into strips, which are wrapped around a silk core, and then that's used to weave into the clothing. So you're literally wearing real gold here. It's, it's extraordinarily heavy, and it could even be melted down. If times got particularly hard, you could turn your clothes back into gold bullion. So <laughs> that's why there are so few surviving of this type of fabric. We only have really tiny samples. So that, and both of those things, so the red dye and the um, fabrics woven with gold thread, were strictly limited to the nobility. You weren't allowed to wear them if you weren't um, born into that class. However, Elizabeth wants to say something else. She wants to say that she's royal. And she's doing that through, you can see the red fabrics on the right of this detail, and then there's another fabric here on the left. This is, makes up what's called her forepart here, which is at the front of the skirt. And that fabric's been woven from silver thread, and then it has these tiny little loops of gold thread coming up. You can just about see them. The artist's taken great care to depict them really carefully. And you could only wear this, which at this time was called cloth of silver tissued with gold, if you're a member of the royal family. So she's making a very conscious statement here about exactly where she fits into society. So let's turn again to my dress. I was allowed to wear whatever color I wanted, any type of fabric, any type of garment. There weren't any um, kind of dress restrictions on me. In terms of color, this dress, it's, it might not be very clear to see, but it's actually a very dark blue. And in terms of 16th and 17th century dyes, it's um, most close to indigo, which was another expensive dye imported from India and, again, limited to the nobility. If you were someone of my status, I'd classify myself as middle class, you'd um, have to make do with woad instead, which is gen um, chemically related to indigo, but it was found in Britain, it was much cheaper, it was much less color fast, so it would wash out more quickly, and it produced a much less intense color. And I think it's really interesting that we've sort of come full circle. So the synthetic version of indigo is actually used still to dye one of the most democratic, I think, items of clothing, blue jeans. Um, I'm wearing um, my version of democratic clothing here today in front of you. And synthetic indigo produces the full range of colors for blue jeans. Um, blue jeans have their origins, incidentally, in 19th century men's working clothing. So again, it's moving that working class dress into, to spread across all different countries, um, ages, genders, and social classes. So the next point to make is that when I put my dress on, I didn't have to have any help to get into it. I simply put it on and zipped it up. It was very simple. But that's definitely not true for um, someone like Anne of Denmark. To get into what she's wearing here would have required lots of help, and it would have taken a really long time. I'm going to show you some of the ways that she's showing that through her dress. So she's wearing a skirt, and that skirt, before she put it on, it would probably have been a, a pretty um, simple strip of fabric. And it's been put over what's called a farthingale, so that gives it this sort of drum-like shape. And each of the pleats that you can see around her waist would have been set every day and pinned into place by her maidservant. Um, it would be nothing without that, and she'd have to do that every day. Other features to draw attention to are the fact that she um, has had her hair set uh, over a wire frame, jewels set into it. She's wearing a bracelet that it's actually impossible to tie yourself. Someone would have needed to do that for her. And um, she, her sleeves would have needed to be tied into the um, shoulder. They actually would have been separate probably at this time. So this is all telling us that she needs servants, she can afford servants, and she has lots of spare time to spend on her appearance. Um, she has no need to labor outside or do anything useful like work, and that also is shown by her very pale skin, which was the most fashionable um, type of skin until the 20th century, a suntan not being popular uh, until it began to represent the fact that you could go abroad and could afford holidays. So, um, the pace of change of fashion has changed dramatically over the last 400 years. Um, that's due to better communication, so we can spread ideas more quickly, and also due to better methods of production. Um, the sewing machine, just to go back to my dress, um, was a major change in the 19th century that meant um, even amateur dressmakers could translate designer clothing into their own version without the 500-pound price tag. Badgley Mishka, that's the average price of one of their gowns. 
Taking this into the digital age, companies like Cubify have created what are called 3D printers. So you can actually, this is sort of the next step after sewing machines, um, you can create your own shoes and change the size or the color or the details and print it in your own home. So I wonder if this is where um, the production of fashion is going next. In the, in the 16th and 17th century, as well as having these laws set out about exactly what you could wear, you also had these social etiquette rules that weren't necessarily laid in stone, but that everyone adhered to. And I'm going to give you one example, which is that of hat honor. And in this painting, which shows Charles II, we've heard about him earlier as well, um, he's actually wearing a hat in this painting. And everyone else, apart from the members of his family, have taken their hats off. Removing your hat was a mark of deference to your social superiors, and to not do so would have, helped, would have um, meant real trouble. So the other members of his family are, he's got his two brothers and his nephew, and they all still have their hats on. Everyone else has taken theirs off. There's actually one just here in the shadows, and the other, another man up there is holding his. The artist very being very careful to depict the fact that this hat etiquette is being adhered to. I didn't have to wear a hat with my ball, ball gown, but there are still occasions, we've seen at Ascot, um, that a uh, hat is the expected attire for women. And remnants of hat honor still exist today, so a man going into church or attending a funeral will generally remove his hat as a mark of respect. So I hope I've given you some ideas of how fashion's become more democratic. Um, it's no longer limited to the elite. Fa you can be fashionable in cheap clothes that are quick to put on, and there's much more choice available. Even though the fashion press can sometimes seem quite dictatorial, using terms like must-haves for this season, um, there aren't actually any laws anymore about exactly what you must wear or must not wear in the Western world, at least. However, we do still face some unspoken societal customs. So the male business suit, which is such an important part of the male wardrobe for the majority of people working in professional environment, and most MPs and politicians do stick to that as well. Even Dress Down Fridays are sort of renowned for their uniformity of dress. So I've been wondering if politicians would better represent their enthusiasm for democracy and perhaps better represent the people that they serve by being more varied in their dress. Um, maybe we've seen this in newsreaders over the last 10 years with the loss of tie. Are they trying to be more like their pe the people they represent? However, I'm a little concerned that as a country, I don't think we're quite ready for it yet. Um, just think of the response to some news articles where there were photographs of politicians taken in their own time, in their free time on holiday, and the kind of weird reaction we have to seeing them perhaps wearing jeans. Indeed, many people equate being dressed smartly with being confident. So we have confidence in people when they dress smartly, and we think that they have more confidence themselves. I was actually a bit worried coming to speak to you today wearing jeans and t-shirt, and I wondered if it would affect my performance. Would I still be able to think as clearly as I would if I was more smartly dressed? In the Royal Collection, we don't wear jeans even on Fridays. So, um, I've heard of a tutor who recommended to his students that rather than cram on the morning of an exam, they should spend the time instead getting dressed, getting very smartly dressed, spend time on their appearance, because he equated being physically prepared with being mentally prepared. So I wonder, do politicians feel that their clothes affect their performance at all? Um, is there uniformity in clothing? Does it have an impact on their willingness to perhaps break away from what everyone else is saying and thinking? And are they, does it have any effect on that? Is the blue and red tie convention a help or a hindrance? That's all right. Thank you. <laughs>